Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. For those joining us wherever you are, hello everybody. My name is Nicola Vegra, Senior Sales Planner over at the West Coast at Times of West Coast. I'm today's host for the hour. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to the joint efforts of Tabula Bain, Susie Osman, and Tabula Black, Nika Coley, for bringing this panel discussion to life. Creating this panel discussion runs deep in our hearts with recent events that have transpired in 2020 has shed a light about the injustices that still prevail globally when it comes to race. We as individuals have the responsibility to address and educate ourselves on such matters. Since we were all work in the media landscape, it is imperative to bring diversity and equity in the workplace. To begin such change, we are kicking off our very first panel discussion, Black Lives Matter and the Creative Industries and what we can achieve in 2020. Here today, we have our very own from Tubula, Mark Thomas, Managing Director of Northern EMEA as our moderator, our guests for the hour are Colin Gillespie, founder and chief strategy officer of All Response Media. Colin has a pedigree background in customer acquisition media, co-founding All Response Media in 1995, which is the leading customer acquisition media planning and buying agency in the UK. We also have Lauren Ingendeco, head of response at PhD UK. Lauren has over 16 years of digital experience focused on developing and co-developing strategy and brands for across media, marketing, and advertising. And last, we have Kaval Khan, Chief Revenue Officer of Tumblr. Kaval is a digital advertising veteran with experience at Microsoft, Twitter, and Vice Media. He joined the social networking site Tumblr, the creative utopia, which I might add, which led me and many others to discover the greatest Frank Ocean. And now I'm taking it off to Mark to begin. Thank you, Nicole. Well, it's a big welcome to everyone. So uh, thanks for joining the panel today. We are super excited to have such an inspiring group of business leaders with me to share you know things that matter to them but to so many people in the industry since the tragic death of george floyd and the far-reaching movement of black lives matter you know it's really triggered people and businesses to truly think about their diversity their equity and inclusion plans or general lack of them with still poor representation in the industry for black people our aim today is to share and uncover just why it's so key for our industry to do better and how companies and business leaders and each one of us can make a positive difference to help drive more change and ultimately results in clear actions. So today, the format is going to be, I've got a few questions for our panel. Uh, we all caught up yesterday. Uh, and what we realized is that we've got around four or five key questions or key topics that we're going to discuss. Uh, there's going to be a lot to share. We, we already find that there's going to be a, an, an immense amount of discussion and hopefully some kind of clear actions that you, uh, you can take towards your, you know, your business, or personally how you live kind of your everyday. So the format is I'll ask a few of the questions uh, and at the end I'm gonna try and wrap up for the last five minutes and then Nicole will then close. Uh, so I'm gonna do my best to try and capture as much of the ideas as possible. And, and as time waits for nobody, let's just kind of dive in. So my first question to kick off and it's gonna to be to, to Lauren. So Lauren, are you there? I'm here. Good, 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 <laughs> good, to, good to see you. So as a leader within our industry, how can you encourage more people to feel comfortable in discussing what needs to be done in order to, to, to achieve equality? So th this is a really good question. Um, and I think I will start by saying we have to feel uncomfortable before we can feel comfortable. Um, we've got to acknowledge that, that not much has been done in the last um, God knows how many years. I think in the UK, the IPA set a five year target for agencies um, to hit their DNI numbers. So they had some really specific numbers in place. So 15% of people in leadership positions, 40% uh, uh, senior women and so on and so forth. And we're so far away from those targets and it's actually gone down at, uh, this year, I believe. Um, and the reasons haven't been cut and uh, they've not been clear. It's been quite cut and dry that there's, so, there's still so much systemic um, racism in culture across the UK that we've not got to the point that we have we're anywhere near those targets so I think that we've got to face the uncomfortable truth of where we are before we start to get to the nitty-gritty of right okay well what do we need to do to make things better and there's been lots of conversations um, in my organization around this and I've had some really frank debates and you know some really uncomfortable discussions and, and that's how I see things moving. Great, great, good. Just leaning into that actually, and by the way, hi everyone. Um, and thank you very, very much for coming. Um, 
where you're at, but can you hear me, Mark? Is that okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. You just you just cut out for me a little bit, but um, but all good. Carry on. Okay. Apologies for that. Yeah, no, I'll just, just saying I'm just leading into what um, Lauren said, and actually just thanking you guys again for the platform, actually, in the, uh, the intro that yourself and gave. I mean, certainly before I, I give my opinion, I think it's just to set some context. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to found this business, co found um, so I, I also recognise that um, being a man of colour, um, I mean, I guess I'm hopefully part of the beacon waving um, that should be out there, but equally, I also know that I'm part of the, the, the challenge, I wouldn't say a problem, challenge with what Lauren's raised. And I think the point you made, Lauren, um, really the essence of the question is a really important one. Um, it's a really uncomfortable subject, so I think the idea that we want to make it comfortable, I'm not quite sure how that sits with me, because it's, it's an uncomfortable subject. And the reason because you're asking people to confront, um, unfortunately for some people, um, very unpleasant truths. Um, but these are truths, by the way, um, that may well have been delivered by um, their forefathers. And, and we all, you know, I mean, we're familiar with the, the, the saying around, don't punish the children for the, the errors of their parents. Yeah. There's a little bit of that. Um, but that's not to say that we should deliberately feel um, that we try to make it comfortable. The other thing I'd also say is, um, from my perspective, I actually don't mind positive discrimination, um, which is, which I guess is a bit of a paradox, because I also believe that meritocracy beats everything. Um, and, and that's, and which, which is why you do get this paradox. So the idea that I'm saying, actually, um, whether there's a, a conscious bias or unconscious bias, don't mind, but lean into the opportunity that the discussions that everyone's having now and the opportunity ultimately that that's being afforded. Um, but for our business, um, and just to give again some context to how um, I think, um, our business is one ultimately um, that's familiar with numbers. Um, we, we thrive on data um, on the basis that it's difficult to make change um, and change that's lasting unless we believe it can be measured. So what I would say in, in relation to the question that you asked, um, if one is able to build parameters around how we can measure the outcome that we're trying to achieve, how do we actually measure those outcomes, then I'm totally fine with that. Um, I mean, I talk about um, you know, measurable deliverables, um, whether that's in the work environment, outside of the work environment, how we show improved pro um, productivity, how does that relate into QBRs, ultimately, actually, how does it affect the bottom line? Um, because we also know um, that money is a real driver of change. Um, we all work in commercial organisations and clearly we're there to do a job for our stakeholders, our stakeholders being our shareholders, um, other stakeholders being our employees, um, our commercial partners, um, and ultimately the other stakeholders being the consumers that are advertised as well. There's a whole co cohort that we have to be lining up behind in terms, in terms of making sure that what we do as a collective is actually driving the outcome. But again, just to repeat, I, I think... And, and this discussion panel, um, I guess, encapsulates that. There's a degree of discussion that we can all have, um, but unless there's a measurable outcome, or at least an ability to come back and measure what it is we've discussed, the changes that we're looking to achieve, are we actually moving those goalposts? And all we're doing is talking about it. So I think action and having a very clear plan of action in terms of deliverables would be how we run our business. And, and certainly I'd suggest how the business is listening into this call now. That's what the site is. Okay, great. So, so, just, so sorry, can I just add a build on the commercial side? And, I, and I'm sure um, Cavill will probably have something to say. Um, there was a study that was commissioned um, by the UK government in 2016 to look at the barriers that are facing people from ethnic backgrounds um, from thriving in the workplace. And um, I believe the, the group that commissioned this is, uh, sorry, the group that did the report was McGregory Smith. I think it was a McGregory Smith review. And they found that if organizations were more inclusive and they had more people um, you know, um, participating equally, it's worth 24 billion to the UK economy. Now, every, my problem is that everyone knows the numbers and they understand how to grow. What is stopping them from you know, making that leap and making that step in the right direction? Like the numbers are there and we've heard so many reports about how much you know, that the ethnic, people from ethnic background can drive in our industry. Why then are we not making that change? 
Can, can I just come back to you on that? Then? Really good point. And, um, and we're, we're not a public company, but certainly one of the things that I've seen, I guess, in another category that everyone. Uh, quite Colin, Colin, um, Colin, just to interject. I, I just need you to put in your other headpiece. I think your microphone doesn't seem to be working. So if you can what about, talk. What about now? I think that's so much better. And I wish I did it before. So carry on. Go, I go ahead. You got some, go on. Go on. I apologize. And um, Lauren, just, just your points around, um, as you say, how do we actually deliver some of the numbers that, that people talk about? Um, I mean, there's categories out there. Um, and if you take me wrong, I'm sorry. At the moment, talking about adding ESG ratings um, to the, um, if you like, Whatever makes up their, their, their shareholding price, their stock price, history rating seems to be a currency um, looking at. So I guess one thing could be, and again, I come back to the idea that where there's money involved um, and there's pain to, to potentially stock price or evaluation, then that might drive a behavior um, rather quicker, I would say, um, versus um, that of an agenda um, or people trying to form a movement. And if EDI in some way was... Um, was monetized um, in terms of a, a rating or a score, um, and companies were embracing that and therefore quite happily to publish that um, as part of their um, what makes their their governance um, piece more complete. And I think that probably would drive change. But the last thing I would say, and sorry, Mark, for hogging it, the last thing I would say though, um, in relation to the first question, I'm also really passionate about the idea that we can't do with condescension in terms of the debate that we're having. So for sure, there's lots of people who don't understand um, and they need to understand, but equally, we can also go to the other side, which is we just get into a conversation where it's actually quite condescending. There is definitely a balance to be played out, I think. Agree, agree. Okay, thank you both. And, and while I'm, I'm gonna move on to the other question, I've taken out some really interesting points there, so thanks both for sharing. And Colin, I'm gonna ask you, Ideally, if you could take out those headphones, maybe, and see if it works better without the headphones, because the, the you, what about now? Nah. Yeah, let's just let's just try that. Let's just try that and see without the headphones. And if anyone's behind you, you know, they, they're going to have to listen <laughs> in. They're going to have to listen in. Anyway, so moving on to the next question. So, um, and I'm going to start this one with uh, with Caval. So, Caval, you know, being being a, a man in in New York and, and and you know from from the US, what's your advice for for young black professionals? That do not see themselves reflected in leadership positions at their current company. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and it's something I've I've faced throughout my career. You know, I can tell you that even starting at Microsoft, when I became an account executive for the first time, I was you know the only. When I went to Twitter uh, in a sales role, I was the only black person. When I moved into leadership, I was the only black person. Every role since that point, I have been the only, and so there was no one I was looking at within the company that I could look up to to say, hey. I can be that because I see someone there who looks like like me. And look, there, there's a human truth here that we is a part of this conversation that we don't have, which is that human beings are innately tribal. We, we search for connections with each other. And there's many ways that connection comes from. It could come from your country, it comes from your community, but it also comes from your race and it comes from your gender. And so when we enter into the workplace, we're trying to find that community and that tribe for ourselves. And so having someone, as you're thinking about your career, that looks like you, that understands is not just, it's not about the color of your skin, it's about the experience that you have. Uh, and it's about how they can connect to your story uh, and help you to navigate from your, your story to the success you need to achieve. So it is important to have those. My advice is that, you know, while it is limited, when you look at it as a percentage um, of, of executives, there are black executives uh, specifically um, across a number of companies that are probably in roles that you wanna be in as you think about your long-term career. And so if it doesn't exist in your organization, you have to be you know, proactive in seeking that out and finding executives in that role that may be in other companies. I can tell you from my own experience that I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have people investing in me who were far more senior than me, educating me and coaching me, uh, and, and, and frankly, help telling me when I was failing and, and, and giving me that kick in the butt sometimes. Uh, but they were not always in my organization. And especially the ones that look like me were definitely not in my organization for a long time. And so I had to look outside of my organization. 
what, what the time we're in and the capability that exists now, especially if you are a younger millennial or Gen Z coming into the workforce, is that there is so much information at your fingertips. So whether it is finding people on LinkedIn or social media or through the trades, if, if you can go out there and network and find these folks, and even if you never have a conversation with them, you can follow their writing, you can check out the podcast they're on, uh, and you can learn so much. There are people who I consider my mentors who I've never met, but I follow them and I follow their digital presence uh, and they drop pearls of wisdom all the time in what they write about, when they speak, when they appear at conferences, when they're on panels. Uh, and that helps to guide me uh, from, a, from a leadership standpoint. So yes, there should be an effort to you know, push your organization to have more executives that's reflective of you know, just frankly, the, the, the country and, and the world. But if that doesn't exist, that doesn't mean that you fold your hands, you can still seek it out in other places. Yeah, right. And, and actually, if I come up, did you, throughout your career, how, over the last 10 years, how many times did you have more of a dedicated mentor? So I get the, the concept of you following different people, getting inspiration from outside of your current, you know, current platform or situation or, or current company. But at the same time, you know, how, how, how long did you have a specific mentor and, and are there any different uh, places to try and seek out, let's say, kind of relevant mentors within the black community? Sure. Um, there, for, for me, I've been fortunate in, in the U.S. There is an organization called Ad Color, uh, and I've been able to attend that conference on a regular basis and, and see so many people who I've had dedicated mentors, and, and a lot of them I met through through Ad Color. Uh, but as I've gotten more senior, you know, my I, I I less have mentors so so much, and I more have a board of directors uh, and people who have different backgrounds, uh, folks who I need to go to when I need to understand how to navigate something as a black executive, folks who I need to go to who is just about navigating something as a revenue leader, uh, folks who I need to go through to navigate it in, in multiple ways. And so having a broad spectrum of folks who you can talk to uh, is how I now manage uh, my, my, that, that part of my, my career. Um, but yes, having dedicated folks, especially when you're in that early and even more so when you're in that mid-level because yeah. the middle is where people get stuck and the middle is where people churn out. I call it the muddy middle. Uh, and that's where you really need the help uh, from someone because that's the stage in which people know you have the capability. And capability isn't enough to drive success. You have to know how to navigate your organization. You have to understand what else are the KPIs beyond just doing great work. Uh, and having mentors that can help you with that is, is so critical at that stage. Great, thank you. And, then, and Colin, anything to add? Yeah, um, I, I think everything that Kevin said, I mean, I can relate to that as well. Um, with my Other ways, it's much clearer. This uh, It's about 85%. <laughs> It's, it's you're still missing 15 percent, but we we will crack on now this this is this is the uh uh the good and bad of zoom anyway yeah, yeah no i'm just saying that i, I definitely um empathize with everything that cabal just said and um, what i would say though um and this is what we would that's that meritocracy piece um what i what i always say to all of our guys here is they have to hold the management to task so if the exam question is how do i progress in my career um, and that may come across in a QBR or, or a similar type um, PDR type format, if you like, um, then whatever has been agreed as these are the steps required to make the next, the next leap, if you like, um, then those should be documented and the manager should be held accountable for actually if one delivers on those points. Um, but there is, you know, it, it has to be meritocracy based. So I don't, I mean, I, I talked about, um, you know, back to this, um, if you like, um, positive, um, positive bias, if you want to call it that. Um, I don't mind that, but you have to step up to it and you have to own it. Um, so, you know, the idea that you give somebody a right um, doesn't necessarily mean that they should just walk into that, that position, let's say. So one still needs to earn it. So I suppose the difference being, um, if you like having this proactive bias from my perspective is, if the door is open, then you go for it, but you have to step up and deliver on it. Um, but equally do hold your managers to account. Um, and everything Cabal said about um, certainly where, where mentors reside, um, it's really difficult. When I, when I started 20, well, actually I've been in media for just over 30 years now. And as I said, our agency has been going for 26. Um, I can recount maybe only two other senior black people at that time, if, if that. Um, and they were guys, not even women. 
Um, so um, we're definitely in a much better position now, um, but definitely lean into skills um, rather than believing it's a rise. Great, thank you. Okay, and, and then moving on to another question. So um, Lauren, you've been very kind of proactive on this point, so I'm gonna to come to you. So retaining black talent has been highlighted as a challenge across our industry and actually, especially in the UK. So for example, ministers and the UK CEOs often said this is a major challenge that we have in some of the recent events that I've attended. So what do you think organizations should be doing to try and help this initiative? So I think the first step is to recognize why that talent is churning. Um, and having spoken to a lot of um, people that have left organizations in our industry, I think Caval made, uh, Caval made the point about the messy middle. That's exactly when they leave because there's a, I mean, there's a glass ceiling. Um, I think it's, it's, fit, it's fair for us to, to sort of admit that that exists. Um, in our industry and there's not enough career sponsors uh, for black people so again back to Caval's point about not having you know people even in another agency or another you know organization that you can lean on um, we're so sc scarce in the UK that th there's there's just such a small group of people to go to to say hey I'm having this challenge in my organization what can you do to help me then there is something that really annoys me when I hear that um, there's no talent. Um, I hear that all the time and I'm like, talent exists. It's just the access, right? And the opportunity that doesn't. And, you and so, so Lauren, are you talking about there's no talent when you are recruiting and searching for-, for No, for senior talent. talent. So senior talent, senior okay. Talent. So the yeah. people need, needed to kind of move from that mid to, to the senior bit. Um, and they exist and they just get stalled. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why um, that happens. Um, again, there's the, the lack of career planning, the lack of investment in career, in career planning. Um, I was quite fortunate to get um, executive leadership coaching in one of my previous um, agencies. And that is a, wouldn't have been normally um, available to me because I wasn't a natural selection, if, if you get what I'm saying. And you have to get to a point where you make that unbiased, right? The categories for entries um, for programs like that can't be based on, right, I, I get along with this person or this person reminds me of me or, you know, this per I know this person's um, cousin or uncle or whatever. It has to be completely unbiased mm -hmm. and you have to give those, everyone that same equal opportunity to, to have access to training to get to the top. There's also something about culture. Um, and the, the media agency landscape, the culture is really different from, if you're, if you're coming into the industry and you're not used to you know, what you see around you. So you've, got, you've come from a socioeconomic background that's quite different. You didn't go to private school. You didn't ac have access to after school clubs. You just, you've all, you already sort of, there's a barrier to entry already the conversations that you can have with your peers are already limited. So then there's this hybrid culture that's created that's so difficult to penetrate that you end up just think, you get to a point saying, do you know what, I just can't do this, I'm just gonna leave. Um, and then again, to Cavill's point about having people to take you on that journey. I was quite fortunate that a lot of the people that have helped me in my career have actually been white men, right? That's been my like, uh, you know, experience and, and real truth of my career progression. And it's unusual as well to get that. So if we can get to a point where we, uh, where we create access to the top that's completely unbiased, um, it's a complete level playing field, you'll start to see more people from um, ethnic backgrounds have that passion to, to stay in the industry and, and you're giving them something to to um to rise for great great can i just just probe on, on one thing so you say that you mentioned that i wasn't maybe the kind of the the obvious choice yeah <laughs> what um what makes you say that I, I say that because um at the time you know i was again the only black person in in the company um it, it the the people that were put forward were were not were all white people, right? And the only reason that I was put forward was because um, I had a really good relation relationship with um, a senior person, not not weird, um, just the you know they just 
saw me as somebody that they wanted to invest their time in and said, you know what, this is going to be really good for you. And it's a big investment as well. And we're talking a lot of money. And and me not seeing myself as a natural selection at that time, again, goes back to the fact that there wasn't anybody else that looked like me that had made that or that had gone through that sort of training or or, or, uh, career development. So for me at the time, I was like, wow, this is, this is really, I mean, should, should I be doing this? Am I the right person to be doing this? Is this, Mm -hmm. you know, imposter syndrome sets in, starts to question yourself and you're like, oh, okay, how, I hope I don't, um, I hope I don't make the person that put me forward disappointed in my performance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. No, the imposter syndrome. I, uh, I, I have heard that many times and experienced that myself. So it's sort of really a really useful point. Uh, Colin, I think that was any thing that you wanted to. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 um, I mean, just to add to, to um, what Lauren said and just looking at the optics differently and, and sort of imagining it as being a bit of an hourglass, um, and if the sand at the top is, is talent um, in whatever shape, albeit from a Bain um, um, origin, if you like, and if you've got the piece in the middle um, where it constricts um, as being retention, then I'd also like to see more focus on actually just adding more sand. Um, and I mean, the retention for sure is an issue, so that constriction, but adding more sand at the top um, for me would also be clearly a way of um, just moving hopefully moving people up through the gears um, on the basis that if we have more diversity in the organization at a lower level, um, then one would hope that more actually then make the jump, make the divide. Do you think, Colin, that you're still going to be missing the, uh, where you see you've got a lot of people, as you, as you referenced, with that sand at the, at, the, at, at the bottom, and then ultimately when you look towards uh, the middle, but especially when you get towards the top, you're not seeing anyone that kind of either resembles you, that has kind of comes from a similar background. And ultimately what you're having is you're feeling that this is kind of the level that my group or my people are at. And ultimately, yeah. you know, we, 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 we find it hard to try and find kind of common grounds as we kind of move further up industry, because ultimately when you look at, let's say some of the media orgs in London or New York, uh, not many of them, if, if any, are representative of the cities that yeah. they're currently based in. So, yeah. so, 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 so ultimately, there have been junior people moving up in the ranks and, and, and somewhere some of them have gone missing and some of them have felt that that, that, that might not be right for me. I even have a, a few friends of mine that, that left the industry and, uh, and, uh, and decided that it's not right for them. So I'm just trying to, just to probe to say that if you feel that that sand piece is going to kind of get more people in, do you feel that we're set up well enough to try and keep you know, a good yeah. 90% of those, of, of the bulk of people you see going to be. Yeah, so I, I definitely don't have the numbers, but um, okay, so I, I would suggest there's probably more of a systemic issue with what you're talking about, maybe in the types of agencies. So I can only talk to the agencies that I'm more familiar with, i.e. the independents versus the networks. Um, I, I would suggest that the independents, which by definition are younger, um, possibly more agile, um, probably have a more forward facing view um, around inclusivity just based on based on talent and the ability to deliver hopefully towards the remit. Um, so I, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but in terms of if it were a numbers game, then it feels to me that the odds are pro- probably slightly better stats if we could actually make marketing services a career that is desirable and that people want to get into. So I I think about the advent of the internet and, um, and, and what that's delivered for our industry and the amount of startups that existed that just wasn't there 20 odd years ago. Um, all of those by definition, or the majority of those by definition, coming in the latter part, so in the last 10 years, and a lot of those being run by people who are still in their 30s. And I'd like to think those people are more forward facing, more forward thinking than the classic networks that have been around for 50, 60 years. Um, where there's more of a systemic, I'd like to, yeah, I'm suggesting there's probably more of a systemic view as to what progression looks like. So, um, so you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying um, my suggestion is necessarily right or wrong, but playing the numbers game, if we want to see the change that, that we believe should happen, then certainly feeding through at the once, definitely looking at retention, but getting more sanding at the top to me feels like a desirable outcome anyway. 
just yeah. to build on that, if I if I may, um, the so my whole background has been at independent agencies, and to some degree, um, I agree. To some degree, I agree. But even at the top, most of the CEOs, most of the founders, um, are still white. Um, and when you, there is opportunity, there's definitely more opportunity than there is um, when you get to um, advertising agencies. But the challenge that you, you also get, which I didn't um, mention in my last point, is that there are some secret things that you need to know that no one ever tells you. And unless you have some really good relationships with, some, with people, you won't get to, you'll then find out. And some of those things might be being a bit better with commercial training, understanding the numbers for the business, understanding what drives the business. To Cavill's point earlier, no one actually tells you and they expect you to know. And if you don't know, it's like, well, you know, you, 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 I just can't see how I can progress you. But no, you don't get told that. You have to go and find that out yourself. And it's, it's definitely more systemic, I think, in um, larger network agencies than independents. But independents can't go scot free because they they still have a lot of work to do. Great. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, I just want to add just to one thing that, that you both have kind of said there, and just to, and before we move on to the next question, is that there is definitely a, a view that if you are connected either with people that have that you that that, that either have come through to either an agency or a business that is a uh, that are currently a CEO or someone seen in the business that happens to be you know, potentially of a different race or, or, is, or is white. And it's who you know, not kind of, you know, kind of what you know. And ultimately, we're now in positions, all of us here, you know, black leaders in the industry, that we have a, an opportunity to really try to make a difference and, and be that person who you, for example, Lauren, you know, 12, 15 years ago, you know, was having those conversations to try and get to kind of where you are now. Um, just as a quick side track of the question, because I think we've still got a couple of minutes. Do you think we're doing enough, um, you know, as black leaders in the industry to try and help the next generation? Um, to a degree, yes. And to a degree, no. Um, I think there's still a lack of economic power as well, because it's just you. And if it's just me and I'm trying to bring in, you know, 10 or 20 young black people, it's like, oh, right, you're trying to take over. You still have that you know, unveiled um, uh, response to growth in black talent in our industry. And it's only now, and it's, it's so significant that it's just now that it's been, it's actually people are rushing saying, okay, who do you know? Who, who can we tap in to bring in? Whereas before mm -hmm. it's like, oh, right. Okay. That's quite interesting. You, you have who you, you want to bring in. You weren't comfortable to bring in people. Um, and I say that for myself and I don't, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but it, it, it was uncomfortable. Um, but I still tried my hardest to mentor as many young people as possible. Um, and I still do to, 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 um, to this day. And for some of them that are in other agencies that are struggling, I'm giving them tips as to how to navigate those, those uh, I guess, exa um, examples that I went through that they're going through now. But I don't think, I think it's now that it's, it will be more comfortable for me to bring people in. And that's just me being completely honest. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I want. I spoke to you before, all, all about honesty on this panel, nothing else. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I'll, uh, if I can jump in there, I know yeah, we're yeah. on time, but I think my answer to that question is no. Um, I, I think there is so much more that leadership, black leadership can do. And I read something recently that I think is very true that, you know, there's a, because a lot of the times, and I empathize, I am one of those, we're the only people in the room. We are trying to play a political game in some ways to say, well, I need to keep my place so I can do what I can do. And I can't push too far uh, on, because I might put myself at risk. Uh, and it, you have to be comfortable in a place where you're willing as a leader to put yourself at risk. And I think a lot of black leaders aren't yet comfortable putting themselves at risk, even though they see and experience the problems uh, and they came up through a system that is systemically problematic when it comes to race. When they get there, they get comfortable and they don't push enough to kick the door down and change the system that they came through to make it easier for others. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Okay, great, great. Thank, thank, thank you all. Actually, Cavella, I added the next question I was going to throw to you. So, um, 
talking about having a diverse workforce is something that's you know more critical than ever so it's not the responsibility of the black community to, to drive but ultimately everyone so how how can we or how can you encourage allies white colleagues to help drive more initiatives that actually help support this important mission yeah, I think I think that's a great question. I think there is a responsibility for if someone is going to say they are an ally or want to be an ally, then there's work to be done there. Uh, and Lauren made a great point in the beginning that the numbers are there, um, and the numbers are really strong. There, there's three studies that McKinsey ha has done on this, uh, and the last one was during COVID, and it still shows that a more diverse uh, workforce delivers something like 35% better performance for the company. So my, my question to leadership is if I showed you any other area where you could grow your business or improve your performance by 35%, would you ignore it the way you're ignoring the impact of uh, racial diversity? And by the way, there's also a study on gender diversity and, and, and the numbers related to it. So, you know, from my perspective, I think the responsibility of leadership, and I'll just, it's a big question, so I'll stick with the leadership piece. The responsibility of leadership, whether you're a public or private company, is to maximize, one of them is to maximize um, the profitability and the return for the shareholder or the investor. If you have a 35% opportunity sitting in front of you and you're not doing anything about it, it's a dereliction of duty. Like, you're not greedy enough. Like, you need to be more greedy and realize you're, 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 uh, company can do better. So that's that's the economic piece of it. There's also a piece uh, when I think about stakeholders that relates to talent. Um, it all ties back to business objectives. The reasons why to do it, there's a number of them, but on the business side, uh, the talent pool is more diverse. That's just a fact. We are now in a what, and I'm speaking from a US perspective here, but the US is now what you call sort of headed towards a minority majority country where more uh, people in, more kids entering kindergarten are what you would consider a minority than, than, than in any other time. Uh, and they're, they're a majority of, 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 of kids. So we know the demographics point to if you do not have a diverse workforce uh, and you are not welcoming and creating an environment for them to succeed, you are going to miss out on talent. And talent is what drives, talent is a big part of what drives profitability. There's also the partnership piece of it. So as, you know, Taboola is more of a B2B company talking to publishers. If you do not have folks in, in your ranks and you do not have the talent in your ranks, then what is going to be your growth strategy when you have so many organizations that are being built or led uh, by folks of color? I've seen this in my career. I've seen all white men walk into a room with folks on the other side who were diverse and the folks on the other side said, we're not working with you. Like, where's your diversity? There's not a single woman here. There's not a single person of color here. Like, this is not the way forward. It's not representative of our company. So if you are standing alone uh, as, a co as an organization and saying, you're not gonna do this work for whatever your reasons are, but the rest of the industry are a significant enough portion of the industry is moving forward and making an effort, which based on everything that has happened in 2020, we see that progress, mm -hmm. then you're gonna be left out. And over time, your profitability is gonna start go down. Your revenue is gonna start to go down because this is gonna be become a part of business decision-making. And I've sat in enough rooms and heard enough CEOs ask agencies or others when they're pitching them, tell us about the diversity on your team. That is a key qualifying question to be a partner. So as a business leader and a CEO, if you're not taking that into consideration, then your talent pool is going to not be reflective of what your partners expect. You're not going to get the performance you want, uh, and you're not going to be able to continue to deliver on your business. And, and look, that might not change in a year or two, but we're going to hit that tipping point where it really significantly hurts the business. And folks are going to scratch them's head asking why, and a big part of it will be the, 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 the reflective of not having enough diversity across their teams. The final piece I would say, which is less about business, is, you know, everyone should ask their question, especially if they want to be an ally. Like, do they fundamentally believe that people should be allowed to come to work, feel comfortable, and be able to do their best work? Uh, and, and do you have the opportunity to do that? Because if your answer to that is yes, then you, you need to sit and you need to reach out and you need to listen and realize that 
people of color and women and the entire spectrum of diversity. I know this is Black History Month, but this affects the entire history of um, spectrum of diversity. They are not coming to work feeling like they can do their best work. They are not coming to work feeling comfortable. They are navigating. Now, how can you expect to get the best of this talent that you're paying for if they are shouldering so much burden, trying to navigate so much complexity, microaggression, bias, you name it, in the organization and still being able to deliver. Uh, and so if, if you approach it from a point of being a human and being empathetic and understanding that, then you know it is incumbent on those who are in the room when they are in the room, uh, who say they're allies to call out and to speak out when they see these actions continuing and take those necessary steps. As Lauren said, you gotta get comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, because you're not going to be com comfortable and fix this. It is it is a tough conversation. It is a hard one, but it is necessary. And as I said, I come back right to the business side of it. If you don't do it and you continue on the path of, I just want to be comfortable, you're going to see the business dynamics. You're going to see your consumer dynamics. You're going to see your partner dynamics change around you and significantly negatively impact your business. Great. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Javal. I think there's a, there's a lot of points that when, when you raise about the business side of things, and then moving on to the personal side of things, I think that would res resonate with any leader. I think that, you know, as, as you get higher uh, at the ranks of your business and you have ultimately more people to, to kind of respond to in terms of exactly kind of what are you going to be doing next quarter? Or what is the future trajectory of your business? Um, you know, ultimately a diverse strategy, a great diverse strategy that you have in place will deliver the results, et cetera, that, uh, that you're putting forward to your stakeholders and shareholders. But ultimately, I think the missing gap that I'm seeing is that when you raise the point of actually this is proven to deliver 35% increase, I think there are still people that don't, that don't know that or, or essentially don't believe that. And for me, that's where the challenge still kind of rises because I think that you know, data speaks wonders and that's what people in our industry ultimately kind of like to sit on and, and, and look yeah. through. But I, I still believe that there are many businesses out there that, 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 that still haven't seen that, taken that in and, and kind of done, you know, performed any kind of action from that. So I think that the more that we can share on studies like the McKinsey study that you mentioned, I think the, the, the better. So, um, yeah. so thank you for sharing. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Lauren, is there any, anything to add on this point um, here? Yeah, uh, Caval made some absolutely amazing points. Um, the if if you think back to when gender pay reporting was mandated um, and how organisations sort of scurried to ensure that there was a balance in gender pay, and you know everybody's really happy to report that the variation in gender pay has reduced. Um, the, the because diversity and inclusion hasn't been mandated. I think that people still think it's a nice to have. Um, you know, if, if you think about some of the points um, Cabal made, um, you, you're in a place where nobody's forcing you to make a change, right? The shareholders are not forcing you or holding you to account. CEOs don't have it as part of their objectives. It's not tied to your bonus. It's not tied to your remuneration. So it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing there that's holding anybody into, to any accountability. We're just hearing stories of people leaving organizations, you know, the um, IPA sensors continuing to decline. Um, and uh, the other point that Cavill made around the demographic change and makeup of society is one that the generation behind me is just different. There are people setting up their own businesses you, you might have an industry that becomes extinct in a way of the traditional mo model had, had intended, right? If you don't make those changes. Um, the other point that I wanted to make um, ab about this is to the point of clients bringing it up, we are seeing a lot more. I think some of the, the, the last five pitches that have come through, there's been a very clear DNI um, uh, question and answer bit that's it's very detailed. Clients are asking for um, very detailed plans. They're asking for statistics in the business. Um, they're asking about um, equal pay as well. Mm -hmm. So there is there's accountability coming, but I don't think it's hard and fast enough. I think we are going to get to a point where 
um, it becomes do or die. For you to exist and to survive, you have to get to the point where you're more diversified. Um, you will have some businesses just go out, out of business because they're just not going to get there. Right. There's still there's still that lack of urgency and there's still that lack of to your point that you made that people still don't believe in that 35 percent number. You, there's, I don't think there's any more studies that you can put out that proves the point of increasing commercial um, capabilities and, and diversity of thought, yeah. even the, the, the ads that we put out. Right. We're advertising to a very diverse customer base, but the people that are making the ads are not. You know, you, you, you are you're not putting people in the room that speak to a certain culture. There's so many gaffes that we've seen over the last, even this year that I've just been shocked at that. Well, if you had a black person in the room, that wouldn't have happened. You know, if you had an Indian person in the room, that would have, that wouldn't have happened. And I think we have to get to a point where we, we either mandate it or just watch failure and failure will come yeah. where failure comes. You have a resurgence of something new, I think. Got it. Thank, thank yeah, you. I'll, thank you both. One thing that Lauren said that I think is key. And I, We're going to have to be quick though, Caval, because we've got one more question that I really want to get to. And actually, I think it's a question that you, you wanted to uh, to tackle as well. So yeah. go on, one minute. I, I'll just say really quickly, the point around competition is absolutely correct. There's, I'm, I'm in these groups. I'm a part of kind of a startup community. People are building um, these companies to come for you and come for your market share. So if you don't do it, they're going to do it and they're going to steal your market share. Great. Okay. Um, so... Uh, final question that we've got here. So social media, so a very powerful, but sometimes tiresome and ugly place. I think some of the points of view shared, you know, by people of influence and also the general public, you know, it's been, it's been hugely, it's hugely misinformed and is sometimes ultimately nasty, right? So, so what do you think these platforms should be doing to help tackle the issue? Now, Colin, I'm coming to you first for, for this question here. Um, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think we're, all, we're all aligned to the idea that um, real change, real, the, the change we want to see will come potentially when those pain fell. And by the way, I, I say that not advocating violence in any way, but certainly the bottom line and what that does for EBIT, um, whether it's added, additive or it's reductive, that's pain um, for any, any organization. So I think there's a level of accountability that the social platforms themselves should be leaning into way more than perhaps you know, th th those guys have had their feet held to the fire so far. Um, there's clearly a number of technical solutions, I think, that could be brought to bear. I mean, you know, the fact that we now have fake news badges, um, where's, the, where's, where's the, the BAME EDI equivalent of that, for instance? I'm sure that's not a technical stretch too far. Um, I guess, um, and this is just me thinking on the commercial side, I'd also like to think actually how we can use the social platforms as a force for good, um, but actually one where um, you guys, not, and I say you guys, including Taboola um, within, within that sphere. Um, but if we had, for instance, let's say, um, a similar equivalent to what Google have with their Google Grant, um, which is available to NGOs, if there was an EDI impact advertising credit, and I'm not sure how the mechanics of that would work in terms of who qualifies, but if there's a scenario where, let's say, a percentage of your unsold inventory, and this actually, by the way, goes for a coalition of media owners, so not just to Buddha, but I'm sort of challenging and saying, if you had a way of allowing impact um, organizations from the EDI stroke BAME category to have their voice within a native space to actually start giving out positive messages, what would that look like? Um, because I think the debate is clearly one um, that needs to be shared with many. Um, and you know, as, as great as this forum is, we definitely need to have more native, more local discussions, I believe, happening. And I think you guys actually hold the, um, the key to that as an opportunity, potentially. So that's my challenge to you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in this space and, and, and have had to have many, many discussions um, about this. I, as I mentioned, I spent five years at Twitter and I'm now um, at Tumblr. So it is an active, active conversation. And the, the, the answers here are, are really, really challenging, right? The, on one side, you are weighing free speech uh, and the ability of people to, to, to speak out uh, against misinformation and the capability of platforms to spread mis misinformation faster than any other time in, in, in history. Um, 
you know, I, I have a I have a mixed I don't have a clear answer. I have a mixed point of view on this, um, to, to be honest, because I'm also a, a big believer that while you go on social media and you see the comments and, and some of them are, are, are vile and, and false, um, the knowledge of knowing it's there. Um, you also have the same power. The forces of good have the same power on the social media platforms as the forces of evil. Uh, and, and so if you you there's if there's misinformation happening, it needs to be countered. We've seen just as much good happen on platforms uh, because of the capability of the platform as, as there is bad. Uh, and so as human being, we also have to hold ourselves accountable for like, if you're dead scrolling in any platform and just soaking up misinformation based on what you're following um, and not challenging the source of that, 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 that causes men, it's a, it's, it causes mental challenges, right? Like it's a real mental health issue in terms of how people are spending their time there. As it relates to the issue of race uh, and being black and, and, and the changes that, that are taking place, um, I do agree with Colin that there is a responsibility of the platforms um, when there is factual information. There's three pieces of information, right? There's facts, there's just straight out false information, and then there's opinions. And you have to be able to disseminate what is just opinions, which everyone is entitled to, whether you choose to agree with it or not, uh, versus when someone's trying to state something as a fact that is just not true. And I think that's the space in which uh, the platforms have a role to play. Um, also, along with, you know, I think we can all agree on when it comes to hate speech and certain kind of inciting violence. And there's a lot already being done around that. So I'll take that off uh, for now. But as it relates to, to everything else, I think there is a role that can be played to, to say, you know, the labeling, as Colin calls it, are really flagging things um, if they see that the virality of it's spreading at a certain speed to really say, okay, this is moving around. We should check this and make sure what is being shared out uh, because people really do live in these bubbles uh, and, and they soak it up and they soak it up as fact. Uh, they never, they, they, they just look at an avatar and someone can say, I've seen this all the time. Someone on social media say, well, I'm a doctor of this. And I can tell you as a fact that X, Y, Z, I'm like, who's verifying that? You're just, you, you could be anyone saying you're a doctor of mm -hmm. whatever it may be and, and stating that. And so I think there's a personal accountability side um, for that, where we have to say, you know, be careful of where your source of your information is. Um, and then there's the other piece of like, what can the platforms do to ensure it's slowing down the spread of clear misinformation? Opinions yeah. are one thing, but when someone is stating something as a fact and it's clearly uh, not so, and, and despite whatever times we're in, there there is only one set of facts. Something is either true or not true when it comes to certain pieces of information Yeah, and, um, and, and being able and to slow that. And Caval, I, want, I wanted to check with you because I think, you know, as you spend a lot of time in, in social media platforms of, the, of your career, I'm, I find when I land on social media, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of negative comments. You, you rightly mentioned that a lot of positives as well. So it's good to get the spectrum of both. But at the same time, you know, as, as human beings, many people tend to lean towards the negative comments. Many yeah. people tend to, to yeah. lean towards anything that will make you think, wow, shock value. So, so in that respect, do you find there are, there are there's, there's, there's ways that social media platforms and ultimately even the pages that have been created on social media platforms. So if you've got a business that it thrives on Facebook or Instagram, social media, do you think it's your responsibility alongside the overarching platform to maybe try to address and, and understand actually kind of how much of your page is weighted towards negativity and how much of your page is weighted towards, let's say, racism and these kind of topics to try and make yeah. a difference? Yeah, I, I do think that is work that the platforms have a, you know, we have a responsibility to look at and to analyze and, and to, um, and to put in whatever we can put in place to stop that. And, and if you're seeing that your platform is being overtaken, and that is not representative of your company, it's not representative of your employee base, or who you want to be, then you, you, you have an accountability as a private organization to stop that. And by the way, you have an accountability um, to deliver revenue. And if you have nothing but negativity, it's, it's pretty hard to monetize that. I mean, I'm, I'm in advertising. Uh, I can't monetize hate. I can't monetize negativity. Uh, people, advertisers and brands and consumers are going to respond more to positive than they are to negative when it comes to that aspect of the business. Um, so yes, I think we should be, uh, and, and a lot are, 
trying to understand it. But as I said, it's not an easy answer, right? Because you yeah. are also weighing the idea of like, if you shut down one voice, like making a decision about which voices can be heard and which voices can't is a really hard thing to do in, in, in when we're trying to be, when you represent values of free speech and people being able to speak out um, against, mm -hmm. against these things. Um, but you're right, if it bleeds, it leads, as we used to say in TV, uh, and, and human beings are just drawn to negativity. And that's where the personal accountability, kind of mm -hmm. some of that sits. Like we gotta stop and, and say, why is it that we're gravitating to things that are negative? And why are we only following the things that are giving us you know, the T or whatever you, however you want to frame it. Uh, and we really need to say, okay, what, what other information is out there? And are we f not following other pieces of information that could be more positive? Right, Can I just right. add so, one thing? I'll be yeah, really- Yeah, so we just got one minute, one minute. <laughs> I'll be really quick. Um, the social media has got its good and bad points. It's positive for virality. All the things, I mean, Black Lives Matter, right? All the things that we've seen um, over the last few years, um, I agree to the point around um, adjacency, that's a massive issue. And there are some um, platforms that are doing things um, to counter that. But my biggest issue is bias in AI, right? The people that are writing the code, right? They are not diverse. And there's so many issues and things that have been, you know, uh, content that has been, um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? Oh God, it's the C word, censored, right? because the people that are writing the algorithms have they are so out of touch with the people that are creating the content i think there needs to be a complete reform um if anybody saw the social dilemma of netflix uh, that is it was a, it was one of those shows that i just didn't want to know existed but it's the problem is so compounded and it's i think it's so out of reach for the platforms to control because it's it's making so much money and how do you start to put some things in place to pause that money that's going to be the biggest thing like do we mm -hmm. still drive revenue to, to Carol's point or do we continue to let it grow organically so yeah that, that was the only point I wanted to make well great thank you for sharing all really okay. useful points so so that was the, the final question that we have uh for, for for the panel today I've got just a couple of minutes just to wrap up and then I'm going to pass through to, to Nicole um but lots of cover there so Amazing. Thank you, everyone, for sharing all, all, all that information. I think there's a lot of points I've taken on. If I if I'm don't capture anything, we are going to be sending an email to everyone uh, that, ha to, that they can see this video um, and they can kind of watch over and kind of look through some of the things that were raised. But, you know, I really love the points of, you know, the start when Lauren was saying that we have to feel uncomfortable before we can get, get uncomfortable. This isn't an easy subject. When we come out of the, 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 this, this conversation that we're having now, we go back to the everyday day life, it isn't easy to kind of come through and, and discuss certain topics with, with some people and, and, and how we can try and embrace that. Uh, that being uncomfortable before we feel comfortable, I think is really, really key. You know, money is a real driver for change, um, you know, and, and the panel really kind of shared that. And I would then just kind of add to that, you know, how we can kind of track and measure that. If we can track and measure it in a, in a clear way, I think we're going to be in a much better position for, for our industry. Um, and ultimately looking at things like, you know, black executives, you know, outside of your organization. I think Caval raised the point saying that, you know, if you're not getting things where you are now, that doesn't mean that that's the end of the road. There are lots of opportunities for you to try and get, kind of get inspiration from, from kind of outside, um, but ideally help promote things that would kind of help you get that inspiration inside. Um, the muddy middle, that came up a few times and I really like that, that, that term. The muddy middle is where I've definitely seen a few things, uh, well, a few people that have left the industry and, and, and some really good people. So how do we help support that uh, in terms of kind of retention and things like this? Um, and then the diverse workforce being proven to actually have better performance and giving you that extra uh, revenue aspect. And I think the points of 35% increase from different studies is, is really, really key. And then finally, just on the social platforms, yeah, we, we, we know that there's, there's a lot to do. It isn't easy. I don't think there is any silver bullet that has been, that has been mentioned here because I don't believe there, there is a, a potentially a silver bullet right now, but ultimately we know that there is a lot being done behind the scenes, but there is more that they can do to try and make sure that the social platforms are, are a much a more inclusive and, 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 a, and a better place to try and be informed of, of all aspects of, of, of life. So, so there's a few things to kind of wrap up on some of the topics we, 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 we've dis we discussed today. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I'm gonna to pass to Nicole, who's been sitting there patiently just to kind of wrap up and, and thanks again, guys, appreciate it. 
So thank you for joining us this hour to listen to our very first webinar. Many more to come in the future. Stay tuned. I hope each and one of you after hearing today's guest took away something. I want to thank marketing, Christy, and our guests for taking time to speak with us today. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Until next time. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye.